Hey, everybody. Many of you know that very soon, Renegade University will begin its webinar, Talkin' Shit, The History of Hip Hop, taught by the great Kamasi Hill. Many of you know him from his unregistered appearance. And if you're an RU member, you will know him as the co-instructor of Talkin' Shit, The History of African American Culture, which was a huge hit. And many people demanded that Kamasi teach another course on hip hop, one of his specializations. Kamasi has a PhD in African-American theology and culture from Northwestern. He has been teaching black history, African-American history for about 20 years now. Nobody knows this better and nobody has a more sophisticated and intelligent and fascinating and entertaining take on the history of hip hop from its roots in the basement of a public housing project in the South Bronx to its position today as the most popular art form in the world. Hip hop dominates the world, and Kamasi is going to tell you how that happened. So go to renegadeuniversity.com. It'll be there on the first page. The seminar, the webinar, begins on January 26th. It meets for three Tuesdays beginning January 26th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. Go to renegadeuniversity.com. Check it out, sign up, and I'm going to be taking it as a student, so I will see you in class. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Thank you to Headspace for sponsoring Unregistered. This last year, has been the most difficult and most stressful year in the lives of many of us. But there is definitely something you can do about it. It's something that I've been doing for six years now. Go to headspace.com slash renegade to get a free one-month trial to the meditation app that has changed my life. Again, that's headspace.com slash renegade for a free one-month trial. My guest this week might be the last professor on earth who questions all authorities and is skeptical toward every official narrative. I say he might be the last one because they're coming to get him. This is my interview with Mark Crispin Miller. I'm very happy to say that I am joined by someone I've been trying to get on the show for a while now, and I'm just thrilled to have him here, Mark Crispin Miller, uh, who's, are you in New York City right now, Mark? I am indeed. It's a great honor and pleasure. I've known your work for decades. Um, you don't know that, but you know I was an academic too for a long time, still sort of am, but um, have been following you since, I guess, the 80s or 90s. I've been well aware of you. and. Um, but in the last year, you have come to my attention again and again and again in ways that have been really shocking, both um, for good and bad, actually. I, I consider you to be pretty heroic right now and uh, maybe maybe the last professor in this country with any balls. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, well, it's a dirty job, but someone has to do it, right? <laughs> Being a professor with balls is a dirty job. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you're the only one feeling it. So. I hate to make you do this, but a lot of the listeners will not know about your your legal case and sort of what happened. And can you just set that up first before we get into the deep, deeper issues? Sure. Um, well, uh, I teach a course. I, I've been at NYU uh, since 1997. Uh, I was hired by Neil Postman to teach media studies. Uh, and um, 
he hired me partly because I, I was a public intellectual like himself, and he wanted people on the faculty who who were capable of addressing uh, not only you know a, a student um, community but but a, little, a larger audience. Mm -hmm. And I've always seen that as kind of my 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 mission to help uh, the public um, uh, grasp media uh, more critically. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the courses I've taught most often at NYU is, is a, a course on propaganda, which I've taught um, for at least 20 years, uh, at least twice a year, both at the undergraduate and graduate uh, levels, mostly undergraduate. And I, I teach it not as a kind of antiquarian um, exercise where you look at the Nazis and you look at the Bolsheviks and you look at World War I, mm. but um, rather to approach it as, as something ongoing and uh, all around us, all pervasive and extremely uh, successful at shaping the way we uh, think and see the world and understand reality. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually don't see any other way to study it uh, uh, honestly or usefully. Um, if you're not going to teach people how to um, recognize it, then, then you're not really teaching it. Right. So um, I, you know, I'd like to be able to say that, that this is common practice in the academy, but it's unfortunately very rare. I mean, there are a number of us all over the world who do this, but Anyway, that's my approach. So, so at the beginning of each semester, I, you know, introduce the class by making that point and by noting that um, when you really attempt to study propaganda rigorously in real time, it can be a very difficult experience, um, difficult intellectually, because um, you, you have to, uh, you know, discover sources of information other than the ones that you're used to relying on and that are re re readily uh, available. But also it can be difficult um, psychologically and, and mm -hmm. socially because mm -hmm. you, you're, you're going to have to prepare yourself to be jostled out of your comfort zone by some of the things you discover. That propaganda is very, very easy for us all to recognize as long as it's propaganda we disagree with, right? Right. right. So if you ask a liberal, what's a good example of propaganda? The liberal will say, oh, Fox News, that yeah. bright book, that kind of thing. And, sure. and he's, he's not wrong to say that. Right. You ask somebody on the right for an example of propaganda, and they'll say, uh, Rachel Maddow, uh, CNN. Again, not wrong. Mm-hmm. But um, that's, that's easy. It's easy to spot the propaganda you disagree with. It's much harder to spot it when you agree with it, when it's mm. pushed your buttons, mm. when it's telling you something you want to hear. And that's what propaganda does. It tells you what you want to hear. Mm. In which case you nod and you say, well, it's not propaganda. I got that from the news. Or it could come at you through a movie or something, entertainment but it comes at us as something other than itself. Right. So what we have to do is learn how to perceive it in the first place. What are its characteristics? And then um, to dig into its claims, seek the other side or sides of the story, and um, then figure out what its real purpose is and, and whose interest is it serving. And this can be, as I say, a challenge. It, it is a necessary challenge. It's, uh, you know, I, I say, I, I, this is not an academic subject. You know, this is, this is a, a subject of the utmost civic importance. And, uh, you know, our survival as a democratic republic is at stake, but not just that, our own survival is at stake. Because often propaganda is persuading us to take courses of action that are extremely bad for us. You know, the most innocuous example would be much commercial advertising, which mm -hmm. will have us buy things that are unhealthy and so right. on. Right. Uh, so this semester I made all these points. Oh, I, I also said, this is important to add. I also said pointedly, 
you're going to hear me say things in this uh, class that are uh, startling to you. And I, I want to make clear to you that I don't want you to believe a single word I say. Nice. Believe nothing that I say. <laughs> I love that. I'm not, an, I'm not an oracle. Nice. And I'm not necessarily right. And I'm not here to propagandize at all. So if I say something and you're shocked and your impulse is to start vigorously shaking your head, as many will do, mm -hmm. check it out. You know, And I don't mean jump on your phone now and, and do a Google search. Uh, I mean, go really dig into it. See if I'm right or, or wrong. You know, If I'm right, then you've learned something. If I'm wrong, tell me in class and we'll argue about it because if we you know, don't argue in class, what's the point, right? Right. So this semester, we're meeting like this, you know, we're not in a classroom, which is something I tried uh, my best to um, get around. You know, I, I requested permission to wear a face shield instead of a mask. Hmm. And I'm, I'm, you know, 71, I have Lyme disease. Uh, so I'm not, you know, a cavalier about the threat of infection, but I, I figured, well, it doesn't matter what I figured. I just made that request because I didn't want to teach in a mask. Right. And I, permission was denied. Oh, really? um, yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. And I'm, you know, several faculty asked for that uh, dispensation. They didn't okay. get it. And I figured, all right, I don't want to face a room full of kids in masks, you know, either, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and sitting six feet apart. I mean, the whole point of a classroom is to get together and talk and have an animated back and forth. And so we were online. I said, look how we're meeting, you know, we're meeting in this extraordinary way. Why? Okay. Well, it has to do with COVID crisis. And in as much as propaganda uh, is something that affects us in real time and is ongoing, it might be worth asking if any aspects of this crisis are the result of uh, propaganda efforts. For mm. instance, for instance, I said, the mask mandates. Um, I would encourage you to look into the scientific basis for these mandates. There are eight, actually there were more, but at the time I knew of eight randomized controlled studies that had been conducted among healthcare professionals over the previous, I don't know, 15 years, all finding that masks are ineffective at blocking transmission of respiratory viruses. That seemed to be the consensus. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was what the CDC said mm -hmm. until early April. That's what Dr. Fauci, Fauci said, said. Right. said on 60 Minutes. That's right. The studies are still studies. They're still out there. Um, I would encourage you to look at those. I also think you should look at more recent studies finding otherwise. Mm -hmm. And now I know you're all lay persons, as am I. You know, I'm not a virologist or an immunologist. So there are ways for the lay person to try to determine if a study is sound. Uh, there are scientific reviews of studies. You can look those up. Uh, in some cases, studies are so defective that it's given rise to controversy that's gotten press coverage. You can find that. And you can look at the universities where the studies were conducted to see if they have any ties, financial ties to Big Pharma or to the Gates Foundation because that suggests a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. I, I said all this. Right. The second week, I think it was the second week, a student contacted me and asked to join the class late. So often happens. And I said, sure, you know, the more the merrier. She joined. And uh, the first day she was there, we were discussing Edward Bernays' uh, classic uh, propaganda from 1928. And, um, you know, she participated in that discussion. And the second day she was there, the mask thing came up again, abbreviated. And I referred back to the original discussion and mentioned the eight randomized controlled studies. I said, I'll make them available to you. They're all in reputable journals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So then uh, the following week, which is about four or five days later, 
I got a call from my department chair um, asking me in a kind of an accusatory way if um, I think he asked me if I discouraged the class from wearing masks or if I had had them read things. I, I forget what he asked, but it was along those lines. I said, look, I, I, I recommended this reading and et cetera. And um, he said, well, I'm going to have to let the Dean's um, COVID task force or whatever it's called. No. Oh, all right. And he told me that a student was on Twitter complaining about my class. Mm -hmm. I hadn't known this. It turns out that at the same time, my wife was getting messages or emails from previous uh, colleagues and friends who contacted her to ask if everything was okay. <laughs> so I went and checked out this uh this tweet was actually a whole stream of tweets from this aggrieved student who was demanding that NYU fire me right. and um, complained that she had called the bias hotline at NYU. So I'm biased against masks, I guess, <laughs> and um, demanded that they take action. And they rightly said that they couldn't just because of something I was teaching in a class. And this incensed her. She said this in a tweet. Mm -hmm. So she went public, you know, to demand that NYU do the right thing because I'm posing a, a threat to the students. And I, I showed, I think this is a quote uh, verbatim, uh, an excessive amount of skepticism around health professionals, which, you know, I mean, um, studies were written by health professionals, but anyway, that happened. But, you know, so students... I've never actually had any student do that to me. Um, but what really uh, uh, floored me was that my chair had tweeted his thanks to her, right? thanked her for this and added, we as a department have made this a priority and are discussing next steps. Okay. <laughs> and that tweet is still up, by mm. the way. I asked him to take it down. Mm. He would. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, I mean, I am in the department. I mean, if I'm not the senior member, I'm one of them. And um, somehow that decision was taken without any consultation with me. And, uh, you know, as I say, I, I, I couldn't believe this. Uh, the next day it got better yet when the Dean and the doctor who advises NYU on its COVID regulations, you know, which are draconian, I mean, led to court battles and so on, hmm. uh, emailed my other students directly without putting me on copy. Uh, first of all, attesting to their belief in academic freedom. I've, I've noticed that's a, that's a tick that they all have when they attack somebody's academic freedom. We right. believe in it, right? Uh, but and they sort of hinted that I had given the class dangerous misinformation and provided links to uh, what they called um, authoritative uh, studies from an authoritative source, which is the CDC. Mm. And there were all these studies from like <laughs> last summer. And, and those are the same studies I had also told them to read. Um, right. But the difference was that the Dean and the doctor were telling them which ones to believe which I don't believe is the function of a, you know, an educator. And then they ended with a stern warning that uh, they, they must wear their masks on campus. I should add that I had said in the discussion the first week, I want to be clear that I am not telling you not to wear your masks, not telling you that. Right. NYU's rule is very strict. I mean, you know, I observe it when I'm on campus. This is an intellectual exercise. Right, right. 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 So then the third punch came, I guess, the next day when my chair pressed me to cancel the propaganda class for next semester on the grounds that it would be better for the department, as he put it, if I were to teach two sections of my film course. I teach that often as well. 
because the high enrollments would be uh, good for uh, the, the program. Uh, fine. The problem there is that they have the same number of students. Mm-hmm. You know, they have the same limit of 24 students. They're always full. They're waitlisted. I objected. I talked to the provost. I, I really had no grounds for uh, refusing to do it. It's the chair's call. So I canceled it. I was supposed to teach it mm-hmm. next semester, uh, this coming semester, which mm-hmm. is a time when I think it's probably more needed than ever. Mm-hmm. So I was really floored by this whole thing and uh, felt mo- at the suggestion of some friends um, felt moved to draft with their help a petition that went up to change.org if anyone wants to see it. Basically um, urging NYU to respect my academic freedom. That's all it asks for. But I, I, I posted it, wrote it in the name of all professors and journalists and scientists, doctors and whistleblowers and activists who have been gagged or uh, punished for their dissidents for decades, actually. Mm -hmm. Although this year has been, or this last year, the the year of COVID has seen a real sharp uh, uptick in censorship, which is intensified still more since the um, insurrection last last mm-hmm. Wednesday mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the onset of what's now being called a war on domestic terrorism. Right. So anyway, I was, you know, blissfully unaware of that future development <laughs> when I posted this petition, but um, I put it up, you know, it immediately started garnering signatures. It has to date over 27,000 from all over the world. Very, very gratifying. And it, its signatories include Seymour Hirsch, um, James K. Galbraith, uh, Dr. David L. Katz, uh, infectious diseases specialist who was at Yale and who wrote this great op-ed for the Times on the unwisdom of the lockdown policy, Hmm. Uh, Oliver Stone, um, Rashid Khalidi, who's the Edward Said professor of Arab studies at Columbia, all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, also whistleblowers like Ray McGovern and Scott Ritter, and uh, Representative Cynthia McKinney and Governor Don Siegelman of Alabama and Chen Guang Cheng, the barefoot lawyer, you know, the Chinese dissident who had his own experience at NYU. Mm-hmm. And um, that was that. And I felt, you know, I had to make this stand. I, I just couldn't. We got to say no to this. It's, it's become uh, really dangerous and wrong. OK, I hadn't seen anything yet because. The petition apparently incensed my department colleagues, most of them, Uh, 25 of whom signed a letter to the dean. This was a month after the student had attacked me, demanding an expedited review of my conduct, (laughs) arguing that, you know, they respect academic freedom. They made that very clear. Mm, Certainly. Yes. (laughs) But that in my case... (laughs) <laughs> it has to be reconsidered because under the rules of the faculty handbook, um, a, a uh, professor's conduct may be so egregious as to nullify uh, his or her academic freedom. And that they argued was the case with me and proceeded not only to deplore my heresy on masks, which they said was my discouraging students from wearing them, and intimidating students who were wearing them. Complete falsehoods. Mm -hmm. But primarily because of my long history for several years, as they put it, of brutal alt-right lunacy and bullying in the classroom. They accused me of explicit hate speech, attacks on students and others in our community, Uh, advocating for an unsafe learning environment, Mm. aggressions and microaggressions, right? Mm -hmm. They accused me of all these things. They said that I had not only criticized a student who disagreed with my statement on masks, maybe they said I attacked her. Uh, By the way, they said the petition was an attack on the department. So they're seeing me as an attacker. (laughs) But... um, 
they they uh, said that I had gone around uh, posting her name and contact information all over the place. So she was now subject to cyber bullying. Mm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, I have never posted her name anywhere <laughs> or her contact information. Um, this is, you know, striking that I have to point this out to people in media studies, but Twitter on Twitter post your own name and you post your own contact information. It's your Twitter handle. So naturally she posted something very controversial and a lot of people attacked her. A lot of people also attacked me. Mm -hmm. So I was cyber bullied too. Um, I was also attacked in three media hit pieces, you know, Gothamist and city and state said I was one of the three biggest losers of the week. Ooh. And some student publication, none of them contacted me for comment. <laughs> but I'm the attacker. I'm the aggressor, you know, here. And they said all this in the, they also accused me of denying Sandy Hook on my website and all these other claims. Right. All, all of which were completely and demonstrably false. The dean, again, I was informed of this indirectly. The dean emailed me and said, I'm, I'm, I'm instituting this review at the request of your colleagues. And here's the, their letter. It's the first I saw it. And sure enough, there, there it was with all its accusations. And he tells me, um, you know, I'm going to do this. He hadn't talked to me. So I wrote to the provost um, and asked her, what, what do I do? And she said, well, I think you should ask for a meeting with him, which I did like this. You know, we met, mm-hmm. we met. And um, he told me he was doing it. The NYU's lawyers had told him he must, uh, which um, uh, parenthetically let me note is not true. Um, the um, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, is a terrific not-for-profit in Philly yep. that takes cases like mine, had written the president, or would, not yet, but would be writing uh, Andrew Hamilton, NYU's president, a, a detailed letter laying out the facts about uh, establishing the legal groundlessness of this procedure and asking him to step in and, and quash it. And, uh, he ignored that uh, letter. But the fact is the lawyers had told the dean to do it. The dean did it. And so this review began about which he was very vague. Uh, he said they would talk to people, right? What people? He said, well, faculty and students. I said, well, what faculty? They've not, they've not seen me teach. He said, well, well stu- students. <laughs> so I said, all right, um, I will be asking people to write on my behalf. And I, I proceeded to do that. And um, I mean, to date, they've got over 50 such letters from current and former students and many visitors to my classes over the years, you know, um, including Kathleen Chalfant, the actress, and uh, <laughs> Lewis Lapham, the longtime editor of Harper's, and now editing Lapham's Quarterly. Wow. Cheryl, Cheryl Atkinson, the uh, journalist. Yeah. Uh, because I, I also teach a course called The Culture Industries, which is about the pressures that people face trying to do good work in entertainment and the arts and journalism. And a lot of people that come to my classes. So I guess 10 or so of them have written as well. Those letters are very gratifying uh, and the only bright spot in this whole story. Mm. But um, that's the review. It was supposed to end in mid-December. I haven't heard anything about it from NYU. uh, So I I assume it's ongoing, nor do I know what it entails. So the whole thing is really um, straight out of Kafka, you know? Mm And that's my that's my story, uh, and I think uh, a good way into the crisis that we're all living through, um, as you know. Well, you're also suing them, though. Yeah, I forgot that. Um, yes, <laughs> fairly right. important. But... Yeah, that's very important. I am suing 19 of them uh, yeah. for libel. I'm not suing the junior faculty right. who signed the letter because uh, I figure they've probably. Maybe they were very willing signatories, but I don't know that. And in any case, willing or not, they probably felt obligated to do so. Uh, 
but I, I, I'm, I signed, I'm, I, I'm, I'm suing them for two reasons. I mean, the, the first is, of course, that I'm suffering from this. This is a, a malicious attempt to uh, get rid of me, to have me fired. Um, and they have sought to uh, destroy my reputation at NYU and elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So, and I, as I say, I, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but um, yeah, I did. I have Lyme disease yep. and, and uh, the stress is certainly not helpful, mm-hmm. but really more important than that. And my main motivation is that this is a matter of principle. You know, this, this just, for the same reason I wrote the petition, I wanted to stand up and say no to this. You can't do this to people and get away with it. Um, it's, it's just wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and we have to say no. So I'm suing the, the 19 of them for, for libel. And the complaint is um, on my GoFundMe page, which people can find. I'm raising money to cover the expenses of this effort. And the money's going into an escrow account my lawyer manages. So I'm not going to be taking any, you know, cruises to the Caribbean on the proceeds. Um, you know, I expect it's going to be a protracted process, with a lot of depositions and so on. I mean, I don't know if NYU is involved or to what extent, um, but uh, it, it, it could turn into a very complicated thing, or it, it could just be a matter of me suing some overzealous colleagues who, you know, whose, um, I don't know, social justice scruples got the better of them, uh, but they know me uh, well enough to know that these things are false. <coughs> Excuse me, one of them uh, wrote a letter on my behalf when I was nominated for a Distinguished Teaching Award in 2012. And a couple of years ago, asked me to step in and teach a class of his. He had to go out of town for a funeral. Mm. So somehow I wasn't this, um, you know, brutal uh, um sort of Hitlerian uh, figure, you know, uh, spouting crackpot ideas and forcing the students to accept them. Uh, so they, 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 they know better, you know, and, and I think that, that, that uh, litigation is completely appropriate here and the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Just over six years ago, I was in a very bad place in my life. I was suffering from panic disorder, tremendous amount of anxiety and terrible insomnia. Many people for a long time had been telling me to meditate, but I just never could get myself to do it. Finally, though, I actually found a free offer from Headspace.com, a mindfulness meditation app. I got it. I took their basics course, which is right here. And I'll never forget the first session after 10 minutes of meditating with Headspace. I felt like my life had changed, and it had because I had these tools going forward after I finished the course in which I could just at any moment reduce my anxiety by being focused, by being present, by being in my body, by being in the space around me, rather than obsessing about the past or worrying about the future. That's what Headspace has done for me hundreds and hundreds of times. I wish I could say I have meditated every day since then. Because every day that I do meditate with Headspace is definitely a better day for me. Overall, in every way. I have been telling my friends and family about Headspace for more than six years now. Because that's how much I believe in it. So I am incredibly honored and proud and happy that Headspace chose to sponsor this podcast. So, if you go to headspace.com slash renegade, you can get a free one-month trial, the same trial that I got more than six years ago that changed my life forever. Headspace.com mindfulness meditation has also been proved in many, many scientific studies to be effective. So it's not just me. It's not just the hundreds of thousands of people who use Headspace. It is scientists all over the world who have studied this extensively. There's really no debate about it. If you meditate with Headspace on a daily basis, just like I did, you are guaranteed to reduce your anxiety, your stress, and to sleep better, and to be more focused in your life. Also, this is the last thing I'll say, I find tremendous pleasure in meditation. I learn to feel the pleasure just in my life around me, in my ordinary circumstances. 
in the place I'm sitting and the smells and sights and sounds that I experience on a daily basis. Because again, it takes me out of the past and from the future, which are almost always just causes of worry and anxiety. Go to headspace.com slash renegade. Get this free one month trial. I guarantee you it's going to help you, especially in these hardest of times. Thanks. So suing 19 colleagues who many of whom sounds like have had grievances with you for a while, maybe without telling you about, I guess, your politics, because they brought in stuff that you had done before COVID. Well, yeah, the student, I should add, you know, within the stream of tweets uh, included screen, several screenshots from my website, News mm -hmm. from Underground, which is at markcrispinmiller.com. Find the petition there. Mm -hmm. Screenshots of, um, you know, for example, one was a chart of the funding of left media. This mm. is from 2013. It goes way back. Mm. But it shows that like the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation and the like are major sources of funding for democracy now and the nation and uh, fairness and accuracy and reporting. By the way, you know, these are outlets I had written for people right. I'm friendly with. Um, these are your people. These are. Yeah. So I thought. Yeah, right. But I thought that that chart was revealing. I showed it. This kind of thing incensed the student who, whose assumption was that this stuff that I was posting was all self-evidently false. Mm -hmm. She said I had taken all of it from conspiracy and right-wing websites, okay, which is a, I, that meme should be familiar to people, especially mm -hmm. since last uh, Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, or I should say, especially since the insurrection in the Capitol, because this will air for uh, some time, you know, unless they hit the kill switch on the internet. Right. Um, so, so my colleagues sort of re-echoed and amplified that message by, by, by referring to Sandy Hook and claiming I denied it on my website. They were deploring my um, a student reported that I had we, we did a, there were group reports on school shootings in one of the propaganda classes, a master's degree class. And um, Sandy Hook came up naturally because it was the first one of these high profile school shootings in this cycle. You know, Columbine was earlier and, and kind of different. And I told the class, I said, you know, if you're interested in Sandy Hook, there is a very troubling but kind of compelling book about it very controversial uh, that you can read, um, has a provocative title and um, it's Nobody Died at Sandy Hook, it's called. And that, you know, may make you flinch. It certainly made me flinch, but I, you know, you should really read it, see if it's, um, if there's anything to it. Mm. And there was also a trial, you know, it's authors had to stand trial and, um, to look into that is of interest, but you know, that, that was the extent of my denial of Sandy Hook is recommending that book. Right. The fact is that to answer your question, as you first posed it, I, I know for a fact, that several of them have over the years disparaged me to their students okay. behind my back and even urged them not to take my classes, calling me a conspiracy theorist. Right. Okay which is, you know, I know that very well. I, we do a whole week in my propaganda course on how that phrase was weaponized by the CIA in 1967. Very important background right. yep. for, the, for this moment, really. Yep. So I think, you know, it's not so much my politics. Um, I don't think any of them think I'm right wing, although maybe they do now because their their notion of what right wing means is 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 very. Um, I, I infer, you know, um, very imprecise and based on a kind of Trump hatred that's led people on the left to see all skepticism toward official narratives as somehow right wing. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been, you know, um, you know, very, very active on the left, uh, uh, probably more than any of them uh, for some time, including at NYU. That's right. 
I, I, I used to, you were firmly established in my mind as a leftist for a long time. And in fact, I was sort of critical of you <laughs> for some of your left wing, very left wing positions. I am less so now, but you have always been a man at the left, at least in the public consciousness, I think. Well, yeah. Although, you know, I have also learned to get in touch with the inner libertarian over the last year or so. Uh -oh. um, Don't you know, do that, Mark. You will well, have even more trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, do you know Tom Woods? Do you know, yep, we're good friends. He's been on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I, he's had me on twice. Yeah. Uh, that kind of left libertarianism uh, mm -hmm. strikes me as very, very rational. But we, I, you know, let's not get into my <laughs> yeah. politics. That right. the answer to your question is that my colleagues were reflexively uh, offended by my dealing with things like 9/11, uh, um, uh, JFK, Dallas. Uh, I mean, the, the kinds of subjects you have to grapple with if you're going to discuss propaganda since World War II. Um, that is to say, episodes that have entailed massive propaganda efforts that were very, very successful and skillful. Yep. yep. And, and, you know, COVID likewise, right? Uh, and, and Trump, uh, the whole Trump phenomenon and the hatred of Trump and Trump's appeal to his own followers this all has everything to do with propaganda. Mm -hmm. Like most members of the professional class, okay, not just professors, but journalists, doctors, lawyers, you know, my, my colleagues um, are um, averse to that kind of critique. They, it makes them nervous. They don't like it. Mm -hmm. And I get that. I mean, I, I have felt that way myself about certain things, but made it my business to overcome that and, and to look into issues critically. I did this because in what happened to me in 2005, my book on the theft of the 2004 election came out. It's called Fooled Again. Right. And it was from basic books, you know, rep, highly reputable publisher, very carefully researched. And it's one of several books that, that have come out that came out around that time that questioned uh, Bush Cheney's reelection. You know, I, I don't think they were legitimately reelected any more than I think they were elected in the first place. I think both those elections were demonstrably stolen. By the, by the Republicans. This, by the is Republicans. Very, this is very important. You wrote a book arguing that Republicans stole an election. Yeah, well, yeah, that one and many yes. others. Yes, uh, yes. The very, this is very important. Yes. Yeah. Well, the subtitle then was, for the first edition, was how the right stole the 2004 election and how they'll do it again unless we stop them. So mm -hmm. it was a very sort of tacitly partisan or anti-right wing uh, subtitle, yep. which I then changed to the real case for electoral reform. Right. Uh, because, I, you know, it's ultimately really not a party thing. Uh, I then edited another book called Loser Take All that came out in 2008. It's a collection of essays by people in the election integrity movement uh, about various election thefts, again, by Republicans um, up to 2008. And, uh, but you know, the summer of 2016 and, and this last summer, we saw the Democrats steal the nomination from uh, Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. I think with Republican help, it's just mm -hmm. my uh, suspicion that the mm -hmm. tech side of it was probably Republican doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Democrats have stolen many an election in their time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, not a partisan issue. But at any rate, the book came out. And I had high hopes for it. The basic books had high ho hopes for it. My earnest and naive belief was this being a, a book on an urgent subject, um, you know, that really, really demands public attention. Um, it, it's going to take off and it's going to make people talk and think and have a useful conversation. Well, the book was blacked out. Got a total of two newspaper reviews, coast to coast. <laughs> One was a hatchet job. Hmm. I had been, I had often been on NPR uh, as a guest, various shows you know, on point, talk of the nation, all things considered, they would not go near this book or any attempt to discuss it. I hired a publicist. I mean, basic books had a publicist. I hired a publicist. This is um, 
Paul Krugman's publicist, Bob mm. Herbert's pub, very experienced. Mm. And she reported to me that she'd never seen anything like the brick wall that she ran into with this book. You know, Charlie Rose, they wouldn't go near it. They wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Mm. Meanwhile, the left press, this was the turning point for me. The left press attacked me as a conspiracy theorist. And this is when exactly? 2005. Okay. The book was conspiracy theory. And again, friends wrote these attacks on me. Uh, the Nation, Rolling Stone, uh, um, uh, Slate. Uh, and um, I was uh, really gobsmacked by this and, and asked myself, what, what exactly is that, you know, conspiracy theory? Where, where did that come from, you know? How did that enter so many minds and become a thing? And I looked into it on my own just by searching the archives of the New York Times and the Washington Post and Time Magazine, mm -hmm. searching on that phrase and on conspiracy theorist and discovered that um, the phrase had really been used uh, only now and then in American journalism since the 19th century, conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in no consistent way, conspiracy theorist never. But it, it started to take off in 1967 and was then used more and more. And now it's used so often, you, you, it's like doing a, you know, a search on um, bread, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're gonna find so many, right. uh, hits that that it, it would be inf an infinite number you know so I, I learned that the CIA that year had sent this memo out to its station chiefs worldwide uh, memo 1035-960 uh, urging them to use their media assets to discredit the work of uh, Mark Lane and others who were uh, the authors of books criticizing the Warren report. Mm -hmm. And they offered various, uh, what we would call talking points for these attacks in this memo, which is a fascinating document. Mm. And my friend Lance DeHaven Smith, who had contributed an essay to Loser Take All and had done a great collection of writings on the theft of the 2000 election, I learned from an essay he wrote that he had made the same discovery. Hmm. So I contact, I was at the time editing a series for the University of Texas Press and I asked him to write a book on this, which he did. And which I'm pleased to recommend, it's called Conspiracy Theory in America. And it's kind of an indispensable history of that phrase and how the CIA weaponized it and how it took off and so on. And it's a good, I always include it in my propaganda course. Um, hmm. So um, that happened to me. And that's what, not only did it change my public image and, and my career in as much as I was never any longer invited uh, onto NPR, I had written four or five op-eds for the New York Times, uh, which back then was a more receptive newspaper uh, on some subjects anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, no, you know, now I was a kind of a, a, a pariah, uh, maybe too strong a word, but I was, I was tagged as a kind of l l loony, you know. And um, all right, I guess I'm. But that, I, so I'm sorry, but like, what's confusing to me about this is this was you're talking about your book accusing the Republicans of stealing an election, yet the right. left descended upon you about it. I mean, this is, you would think that they would be sympathetic at least and yeah, want, yeah. want to hear it at that point. Not what you're saying these days, but back then when you're going after the Bush administration and the Republican party, it's amazing that they, the left couldn't countenance that either. Yeah, good point. In recent years, the CBD industry has absolutely exploded. It's one of the fastest growing markets in the United States. And with that explosion has come an explosion of corporate ownership of CBD companies. If you go online to shop for CBD, you're going to find a lot of offers, but they'll almost all be big corporate entities and 
none of them, I don't think, will be giving you the deal that Paloma Verde CBD offers you. Paloma Verde CBD out of San Antonio, Texas, is literally run out of the home of Carlos and Vanessa Abelar, who have owned the company for about a year now and whose main customer base is you, unregistered listeners. Because of this, because of their loyalty to us, because of what unregistered listeners have done for Paloma Verde, they continue to offer us the best deal you're gonna find on CBD. That's just simple. 25% off every single product in the Paloma Verde store. They also have the unregistered combo pack, which is my three favorite products. And you get 33% off of that. That's the gummies, which 10 milligrams of CBD in each gummy, and I love them. And as I said many times, I'm always running out of them. There's soft gels, 25 milligrams per soft gel. I take several of these per day to help with a lot of issues I have, especially around anxiety and insomnia. And then my favorite thing is their tincture. I put this under my tongue and in just seconds, I'm feeling better and different. It's an incredible elixir. But you know what? I've also been talking a lot lately about their hand cream. I promise you, this wasn't even in the script. Carlos and Vanessa didn't even ask me to mention their hand cream, but I started using it and testing it against other hand creams because of this freaking quarantine and always having to wash my hands. I get really dry and chapped hands. They even bleed sometimes. And I guarantee you, Paloma Verde's premium TH-free, THC-free hemp cream is the best I've used. It helps my hands like within a day, honest to God. So go to PalomaVerdeStore.com, use the discount code Renegade. You get 25% off every single product. Oh, by the way, you get ten, another 10% off if you join their mailing list. The unregistered combo pack with my three favorite products is 33% off. PalomaVerdeStore.com, discount code Renegade. Change your body, change your life, and I thank you. Well, um, I don't know. I'll tell you what's striking about this is that the entire media establishment took the same position then, including its leftmost sector. They stood with the Republicans, basically, in yeah. saying there was no evidence of theft. And let me make one quick reference to the present moment that now, right. when there is probably uh, more there are probably more signs of theft in the 2020 election. Here we go. <laughs> signs of theft, okay? Yes, yes. Red flags. Oh, yes. Of the, of the sort that many of us were noting 16 and 20 years ago. Okay. Now, it's the Democrats and the, the entire press and many Republicans who are saying there is no evidence of theft. Right. Okay. Now, it's possible Biden really won, but you can't say there's no evidence of theft. That's just false. Mm -hmm. And with the voting system we have, and this is an important larger point, we can never know for sure that the victor in an election in this country actually won. We so can't. Don't we okay. rank like 26th out of 26 countries in what is it, electoral system uh, integrity? We do. We do. In 2016, uh, Harvard and the University of Sydney uh, uh, put out this, um, the latest edition of a, of a book they put out periodically that ranks voting systems worldwide. And ours is the worst, as you say, 26th out of 26. Worst. We have the worst voting system in the developed world, the worst. Therefore, the easiest to cheat in. Well, yes. I mean, it, it, right? it, it, it's been established, it seems to me, precisely to abort democracy mm. with bipartisan uh, approval and acquiescence. Okay. I mean, I no longer, sure. for a long time, I thought uh, this is a Republican thing. The Democrats are simply in denial about it. Some Democrats may be in denial about it, but I think Democrats have to know that it's true. I mean, John Kerry told me to my face in 2005 that he thought it was stolen. Oh my. Uh, yeah, um, uh, this whole story is very interesting and it's in the paperback edition in the afterword to okay. Fold Again, if you have the 900 bucks to get a used copy on Amazon. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to give the book to Kerry uh, right when it came out and I uh, arranged to meet him 
well, I mean, I found out from someone close to him where he was going to be at a fundraiser in Chelsea here in the city. So I, I went to the fundraiser. I had the book in my hand and um, in, he, in he strode, you know, looking glamorously senatorial. Mm -hmm. And I went up to him and thrust the book into his hands. And I said, you were robbed, Senator. And to my astonishment, he said, I know, mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> and he went off on this sort of harangue about how the machines are untrustworthy and he's trying to tell his Senate colleagues, he tried to tell Chris Dodd of Connecticut and they say, there's nothing to it. We looked into that. He said to me, they're in denial. Kerry said this to me, hmm. to my uh, complete amazement. And we had a friendly exchange and um, I urged him to consider making a speech about this. And he said, uh, well, I hear you. I, I understand your point, but you know, there's the sour grapes factor. And I, I played, um, you know, um, campaign manager. And I, I, I said, yes, yes, but you could put it this way. It's not about you. It's about democracy, blah, blah, blah. He said, all right, well, thanks for the book. I'm going to read it. Gave me a sock on the arm, friendly sock on the arm. Mm -hmm. And I was elated. I thought, good Lord, you know, uh, and I, I, I left and my book tour started just a few days later. And I was on Democracy Now! Uh, debating Mark Hertzgard, uh, an old friend oh, yeah. uh, who had attacked me in Rolling Stone or, you know, criticized the book. Let's put it that way. Hmm. Said it wasn't true. And um, at, at one point in our debate, he said, well, if, if it were stolen, wouldn't John Kerry have said something? <laughs> I said, well, funny, you should mention that because I and I told the story. And he said, wow, he said Mark Crispin Miller has really buried the lead here. Uh, and the producers of the show sent out a press release. And you, you can find it online, I think, uh, even with all the purges, maybe not. Uh, John Kerry told me he thinks the election was stolen. And, uh, you know, the internet lit up. People were either attacking him for his silence or celebrating that he had said this. And then uh, this is around maybe 10 o'clock in the morning. And then by one or so, uh, Kerry's office released a statement claiming that we never had that conversation. Oh, wow. That Professor Miller had given him his book, uh, but then they didn't discuss it. Like, I, like, like a process server, you know, I'd, I'd mm. run up to him you've been served and I ran away. <laughs> um, so this is actually an indirect way of answering your question. This is a taboo subject. Okay. Mm -hmm. Election theft is a taboo. Mm -hmm. So you don't talk about it. Indeed. Um, if you talk about it, you are running the risk of um, uh, becoming an exile uh, from polite society. And anyone who wants to get a really chilling sense of, of this should get a hold of um, Vote Scam by two brothers, Kenneth Collier and James Collier, mm. which they self-published in the 90s and is in the series that I've edited. Uh, it's eBooks. Uh, it's called The Forbidden Bookshelf from Open Road Media. We did about 27 books that had, have slipped out of print that are important books. Most of them killed at birth. And uh, to their account, they discovered one of them ran for the House, uh, House seat in Florida against the Democrat, Claude Pepper, uh, famous mm -hmm. Red Pepper, the you know, McCarthyites called him in the 50s. Right. And um, they tried to go public with this astonishing evidence they found. It was computerized uh, vote theft. Uh, um, you know, they st interestingly started using computerized systems to count votes in the 1964 election, which is after Kennedy's assassination, mm -hmm. which they interpret, and I agree with this, as one measure taken to ensure that democracy would not miscarry again <laughs> by putting somebody like Kennedy in the White House. Hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's really, I mean, if, if um, there were a, a, an outlet brave enough to um, subsidize it, making it would make an amazing movie the story of their attempts to get this into the media and, and the constant, um, uh, the, the pattern of outlets like 60 Minutes and others uh, going from wholehearted enthusiasm to sudden 
uh, nervous silence, uh, backing away, and so on. There was even an attempt on somebody's life, a uh, publisher of a newspaper that was running their stuff. Hmm. This is a taboo subject. Uh, this means that, that you don't talk about it. And um, that's why the entire media has been in lockstep on this, irrespective of which side stole the election. You don't discuss it when the Republicans do it. You don't discuss it when the Democrats appear to have done it mm -hmm. and definitely did do it in the primaries this time around, mm -hmm. uh, you, you just don't. Uh, if you know what's good for you, if you want your career to um, hold and so on, you stay away from this. Otherwise, you're out of the club, right? Yep. So that, that answers your question, I think, uh, because you're right. Ordinarily, if we had a real right and left, and um, we had a left that was concerned about the will of the electorate, um, you know, they, they would they would have helped me promote the book. But like so many uh, eminent leftists, like Noam Chomsky, who mm. has dismissed uh, election theft as as unimportant. I mean, I had exchanges with him about this. Hmm. Just as just as he's dismissed, uh, the, you know, JFK Dallas not not important, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it, it, silent on Martin Luther King's assassination, silent on 9/11, contemptuous actually of 9/11 truth. You know, he exemplifies the left's tendency to focus on issues of concern only to the left. Right. Whereas these larger scandals would potentially, you know, move national uh, resistance or at least intense concern, they stay away from that. So, I mean, my view is that 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 election integrity matters regardless of who wins. Um, I mean, I have no use for Donald Trump. Anyone who knows me knows this. Um, you know, I uh, I could go on and on about him, uh, and I don't think he was actually elected four years ago. I mean, the evidence, mm. same evidence that we looked at in 2004. If you look at the swing states in 2016, you find considerable evidence that he didn't win, and I don't even think he expected or wanted to. I mean, not many people know that they didn't even have an acceptance speech drafted. Right. And he went home early that night on, right. on election night. He wanted to get up the next morning and start a TV network. You know, that's what he expected. And his, their own polling told him he was going to lose. And I believe he actually did. But I think this time he actually won. And um, or at least there's sufficient grounds for suspecting that he won. But more importantly, I believe it's an issue we should be free to discuss. Of course. And we are now entering a, a moment when it is deemed criminal to bring it up. That's right. And that is a sign of the very uh, fascism that the resistance has been warning Trump was going to bring down on us. Elected officials have defined it as domestic terrorism. That's right. It is now, we're now entering a new uh, war on domestic terrorism, which means on people like us. That's right. Um, and outlets like ours. Now, <clears throat> Mark, um, you're, you are saying that there are at least as many red flags indicating election fraud for this last election as there were in 2004 or 2000. Um, as far as I can tell, you and I are the only people who, in this country who hold a PhD who hold that belief, at least <laughs> publicly. Because... <laughs> Because when this happened, when the election happened, and I looked at the numbers just the first night, I think it was maybe the next day, and I started seeing the numbers out of Milwaukee in particular, it there's just no way that Biden outperformed Obama in black districts in places like Milwaukee and Detroit and Philadelphia and, and Atlanta. Um, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. So can we just, I mean, when I heard that you came out, listen, we got to get back to COVID, of course, but I want to do this first. This is more explosive in some ways. Uh, when I heard that you also <laughs> were, were doubting this, I thought, well, he's completely dead. They're going to crush him. I mean, I, I'm out of the academy. I've been out for two years, but I have felt since election night, since I've started to say these things on Twitter, even among my libertarian friends, 
even among my libertarian friends who are skeptical about all these things, I've gotten nothing but side eyes. I can feel it. No one's sort of addressed me explicitly, you know, directly, but they don't agree with me. They think it is silly, crazy, misled, that I am paranoid, that I have some irrational beef with the left that's causing me to see fraud where there is no fraud. But the evidence... And I can't stand Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani is the opposite of me politically. Right. Donald Trump, I have, you know, slightly more use for Donald Trump, but he's a mass murderer in my view. Um, these people, Steve Bannon, I mean, nationalist populism is almost, is, again, I stand for open borders. I am anti-war. I All this talk about family and, and the church that they get into is disgusting to me. But I think they're right on this. But most importantly, they have so much evidence and that has not been heard in court yet. We well, it hasn't to... been heard. hasn't been heard at all. Which right. Is why, which is why your friends, you know, give you the hairy eyeball. I mean, nobody's heard it. It's been completely blacked out. I mean, the blackout on such information was pretty heavy 16 years ago. Yeah. But not like this. This is astonishing, you know, but. You've mentioned only one example, as you say, it's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, Biden, even with Kamala Harris uh, next to him, could not have roused such a fervent black response because she's not popular with that constituency either. They know her history in California. She, she was the first to lose in the primary. She was right. the first to drop out. Right? Exactly. The least popular of the, the primary. But I mean, you know, the, the two late night vote dumps in Wisconsin and Michigan, I think in, in one of them, Michigan, maybe uh, every one of them was for Biden. And we're talking about six figures. That never happens. Yeah, hundreds of not thousands. One, right. Not one, not one for Trump, not one for any of the other candidates. Right. That's the, it, in 2004. Nobody would have hesitated to say this is bizarre. This just doesn't happen. This is a, a warning sign. There's, I think, 2000 affidavits from people. Mm -hmm. uh, noting gross irregularities by, you know, uh, po election workers. Uh, there are at least, I think I've seen three different videos of mm -hmm. election clerks busily filling out blank ballot forms. You know, I mean, how much more evidence does one need? And but there's a ton of other evidence. Oh, yeah. Um, affidavits are admissible in court. I mean, they're, they're sworn statements. Right. And we didn't have that many in 2004. Now, let me add that back then we had election hotlines where people could report irregularities at the polls. I don't think there were any this time. There were certainly fewer exit polls. And, and this was all enabled by the use of mail-in ballots, mm -hmm. which I opposed from the beginning, hmm. just as I oppose early voting. Because I, I think election day turnout is important. It has to be gaugeable. You know, we have to be able to see how many people went out to vote. Right. If election day were a federal holiday, which is one of the reforms I've recommended publicly, um, it would require a constitutional amendment. Uh, then that would obviate the problem of people having to miss work and eliminate the need for early voting. Every American should be able to vote on election day. Every American should be automatically registered to vote on their 18th birthday. Every single one, so that the Republicans' vote suppression tactics, you know, the ID legislation, it would be uh, impossible, you know. These are things that could be done. At any rate, there's no impulse to do them when um, you dismiss all evidence of theft, you pretend that a victory is self evident when it isn't and wouldn't be even if there were less of such evidence of fraud, because so many votes are, most votes are counted electronically by private companies. Right. You know, like Dominion, like Smartmatic. And all of a sudden Dominion, you know, is sort of being defended even by some integrity, election integrity activists. They, they, they so hate Trump, you know, that they, they somehow think that it's their call who, who won the election. It's not their call, right. you know, it, 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 it's the voters call. So, you know, if they voted for, for Trump, you know, uh, they voted for Trump and you just got to suck it up. Um, but, you know, we, we're not allowed to have the conversation. Yeah. And when you now, now, now there are, I know of one other, I think there were a couple of other PhDs who said these things. Are there? There are, 
there are some people in the election integrity movement who, who are true to principle here. Uh, you know, and I'm in touch with them and, and, and oh. it's, it's great that, you know, I, I, I'm not practically the only one who is, but it is a sign of the times, you know, and an indication of the power of propaganda that this, um, this kind of madness has seized so many of us and especially yeah. the best educated yeah. and the most liberal yeah. Now, these are people who would have been the first to oppose censorship uh -huh. are, now, are now clamoring for it, uh, now demanding it uh, or firing, you know, demand that I be fired. I mean, how many professors have been fired for sins against, you know, the social justice uh, ideology, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, for, you know, pointing out the importance of class as well as race, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, for insisting on, uh, uh, you know, acknowledging the reality of biological sex, you know, uh, even trying to have that conversation mm -hmm. gets you accused of, of, of hate speech, you know. Right. right. This is, um, this is the, the, the sign uh, of, of, of a new totalitarianism uh -huh. that comes disguised as uh, woke, you know, as, as cool, as inclusive and diverse. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the, the so-called left is, has actually been kind of weaponized to uh, uh, abet corporate interests. You know, the, mm. the, the World Economic Forum wants this great reset. They made no secret about this. It's been dismissed absurdly as a conspiracy theory when Klaus Schwab has a book out with that title and the World Economic Forum has a website called The Great Reset, <laughs> and Time Magazine put out a special issue, a cover story, an entire issue on The Great Reset. <laughs> it is not a conspiracy theory. It's an agenda. Right. And this, um, you know, this is an agenda that the left has not questioned or would even discuss. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's criticized as a delusion. And that's... Um, it kind of blows my mind because that agenda and 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 the lockdowns yep. have had an incalculably horrific toll on the poor of the whole world. You know, Indeed. deaths from starvation and malnutrition have gone through the roof. Suicide, domestic abuse, lethal child abuse, alcoholism, drug abuse. Mm -hmm. Deaths of despair are, are inordinately affecting the poorest people most, mm -hmm. right? And yet somehow we've been led to believe that the only cause of death out there is COVID. And if it kills people of color, it's Trump's fault. You know, whereas making hydroxychloroquine available to them early and keeping them off ventilators and recommending vitamin D Mm -hmm. uh, would save their lives. And didn't the AMA yeah. just change its mind on hydroxychloroquine? They just didn't they just say it's okay to use in a memo and a footnote? I think recently. Uh, well, maybe they did quietly. Just, just changed. I think it was like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it was oh, outrageous. Okay. The maybe. number of lives that it could have that could have been saved, right? Well, yeah, but see here again, since Trump touted the drug, exactly, uh, everybody on the so-called left thinks it's false. And, you know, I mean, those who believe every word he says. Right. Those who believe the opposite of every word he says mm -hmm. are letting him do their thinking for them. Right. They're, you know, so he's controlling the agenda. That's right. If something can be true, even though he <laughs> said it, you know, uh, the fact that he then didn't take it himself when he supposedly caught COVID. Well, is further evidence, in my view, that this whole pro wrestling drama <laughs> trump versus the deep state mm -hmm. trump's the guy we all boo and the deplorables all cheer i think the whole thing is is uh, a charade uh, there are many on the right who disagree with me who think that he really is a, a populist and so on i mean i've read several books about this guy i am in new york um I don't think he has a populist or altruistic bone in his body and never has. But what are you going to do? There were people on the left who thought Obama was, you know, 
unimpeachable uh, saint and so on. And uh, right. That's what tribal politics will get you. You know, you worship your your leader. So here's the thing about Donald Trump, Mark. It's it's just like with COVID, they constitute an existential threat to our society. Yeah, right? right. That means that things like freedom of speech and academic freedom no longer apply. Right. When there is an existential threat, we don't have time. We cannot cannot allow you to say just whatever you want to say in your classroom. When we are at war. Right. And now I wasn't alive in 1917, 1918, or 1919. I wasn't alive in the early 1940s. I wasn't alive during McCarthyism. But doesn't this feel like life in wartime? Well, it is exactly like life in wartime. You've hit the nail on the head. I mean, the playbook of the allied propagandists in World War I is the same playbook they're using now. They just updated it and, and sophisticated it. It's remarkable. It is. I mean, I was pointing something like this out a few years ago in going through the um, propaganda over uh, Assad's alleged gas attacks on his people. Yeah. And the New York Times' coverage of Syria, which was yes. in story after story directly out of the playbook against the Germans in World War I. Yes. Horrible, lurid stories of atrocities, all of them completely fabricated. Yeah. And you could not, you were not allowed to contradict them. Seymour Hirsch is probably the greatest investigative journalist of the post-war years, mm -hmm. uh, wrote two pieces debunking the stories of the two gas attacks that Assad allegedly conducted That's right. on his people. The first one, um, he couldn't get published in this country. It, it was the London Review of Books that that ran it. And this is a guy who was on the nominally a New Yorker staffer or was. That's right. And the second one, he couldn't get published in the English speaking press. It was a German newspaper, Die Welt, that published it. So, you know, censorship is the obverse of propaganda. We have to understand that. Propaganda does not want an argument. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not a form of persuasion. <clears throat> right. It's not like, the orators in ancient Greece who would follow one another with their, you know, disparate arguments mm -hmm. and contest each other's arguments and seek the agreement of the populace, the mass, you know, of citizens. Uh, that's not what propaganda wants. Propaganda wants to completely eliminate disagreement, get rid of it. And the best way to do that is to create an, a, an atmosphere of crisis. Yes. Uh, a, an atmosphere of impending war. You're under attack. The rape of Belgium portends the destruction of Western civilization by the Hun. Look what mm -hmm. they're doing. Mm -hmm. Impaling babies on bayonets. That's right. Cutting the breasts off of nurses. They crucified a Canadian soldier. Look what they did. Right. How can you not sign up? How can you question this? What's wrong with you? That's right. Eugene Debs goes to prison That's for right. criticizing the policy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this is why the, the framers tried to mitigate the ability of the president to declare war, because they knew that monarchs can whip up support by uh, uh, starting a war, by using war, to get people all agitated and distracted and direct their energies uh, elsewhere, right? Abroad to help pursue the monarch's interests. They didn't want the president to be able to do that. And that was very wise, uh, unfortunately ineffective in the long run. Mm -hmm. But what we have now is, um, as I say, a sophisticated version of what we had back then, this is a century ago. We then got it again with the um, communist menace after World War II, briefly after World War One. Well, yes, we also had the Smith Act and World War II as well. We we locked up a couple That's thousand, right. couple That's thousand Trotskyists for criticizing right. the war. Yeah, right, right. The anti-communist movement was nascent in the '30s already, but right. it really flowered after World War II. You know, yeah. and, and it served enormous financial interests. You know, the military-industrial complex and all that, and. Sure crushed you know the labor movement and and cowed the left and all that 
Mm-hmm. So you went from the war against a specific nation and its, its brutal people to a war against uh, the communists, which are a little more inchoate. They could be anywhere. Anyone you know could be one of them. Mm-hmm. And then that became even further refined with the war on terror, right? Now we're at war on a, on a, on a, on a what exactly? It was, I guess, it's, it's Islamic fundamentalism. So it's Muslims, right. uh, Pashtuns, you know, uh, these, these dark people over there, these fanatics. Uh, that justified the Patriot Act, which was written before 9-11. I mean, it's right. like yay thick, huge mm-hmm. telephone book of a bill. Mm-hmm. It was all ready to go. And then 9-11 took place and, you know, you had better sign on to it. They were all told in Congress, or we'll tell you you're soft on terrorism, which is basically what Dick Cheney warned them. But now it's taken a, a, it's evolved further. I think it's gone as far as it can go because it's a war on a virus. Yeah. And that virus can be anywhere. It can be in anybody's lungs. It can affect you just walking past them in the street, you know? You better wear a mask and everybody better wear a mask and everybody better get a shot because we're at war. It's a lot like it's a lot like communism. It can spread easily if unchecked. Yes. But (laughs) that was a metaphor. This is right. I know. Yeah, But it's it's the same thing. No, Um, it It definitely is. It's catching. catching, Isn't it remarkable how everything leads back to foreign policy and the American empire? Do you, do you, are you struck by, I mean, to me, that's when you, you know, you talk about Syria. Well, I mean, clearly the sophisticated members of the political class, not the people who are upset about Donald Trump's hair color and his, and his tweets, the sophisticated members of the political class were opposed to him because of his questioning of the American empire, his questioning of these endless wars and regime change and occupations and the rest of it. And for, and Biden's, was he going to be the Secretary of State? Tony Blinken, his main foreign policy guy, this last summer said, we need more American boots on the ground. This is right after they had, of course, had stopped Trump from withdrawing troops from Syria and the Middle East. And a war against the Assad regime in Syria necessarily means a war with Russia. Right. And we know since 1991 that the Democratic Party in particular, but also their Republican allies, have simply not been, they will not tolerate the existence of Putin at the head of Russia because Putin won't play ball with us. They absolutely want regime change in Russia. I don't think that's, anybody could question that. No, I think that's absolutely true. Will they, will they do it by directly going to war on Russian soil? I guess not, although I wouldn't put it past them, but they certainly are going to engage in a proxy war with Russia. And they're gonna start, I think, in about two weeks based on what Biden's people have been saying about Russia and Syria. And that's why that's why they did. They were willing to do everything, everything to get Trump out of office. Uh, Let's talk about motive again with electoral fraud. Right. The motive for the crime is off the charts. In fact, I would go even further. Am I not correct in saying that according to what the Democrats have said about Trump, that he is a Nazi? that he constitutes an existential threat to American civilization, are they not morally obligated to cheat in the election to make sure he is not reelected? If he actually were a Hitler, I might be engaging in some electoral fraud too to get him out of there. Were they not morally obligated to do anything by any means necessary to make sure this guy does not take office again? Isn't that the logic? Well, it is the logic on the assumption that they really do think that he's um, he's Hitler, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I I don't know that they really do think that. This was in the works before the election in 2016. Mm-hmm. There was a new biography of Hitler that came out then, and Michiko Kakatani, uh, the Times' veteran book reviewer, did a piece. That was essentially an anti-Trump piece. I remember that. It was about Trump, but you're right. That's right. The piece was about Trump. Now, anyone who knows anything about him or Hitler has to laugh at that argument. Right. I mean, Trump is kind of a narcissistic sleaze, basically. Yeah. And a con man, you know. And a TV show host. And a reality TV star, you know. Um, 
that, you know, Hitler was, you know, grimly determined to take over and remake the German nation. That's right. And undertook immediately to weaponize the entire uh, government and culture mm-hmm. through, you know, Gleichschaltung, the like streamlining, mm-hmm. which they did. They Nazified the whole system. The party took it over. Trump did what he did, did nothing like that, you know. It's all about himself, basically. Mm-hmm. So the point is that there was a kind of calculation and uh, um, steely um, determination to establish that propaganda meme from the beginning based on very you know, weak grounds, all based on basically on rhetoric and the things he said, things he said, which like Kakatani and others have likened to things Hitler said. Or things, you know, he, or Hitler, things, he, things he might have said in some cases too, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, right. Because they often distort what, what Trump really did say. Right. So, you know, I, what, I, what I see is a very well executed propaganda drive, which doesn't suggest the, the throes of a, a kind of passionate zeal, you know, a, a belief that the guy is really Hitler. Um, you know, I, 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 I think it's, it's really something else. And I, and I, 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 can't, I can't say I really get why they're moving heaven and earth to get him impeached before he's leaving anyway. I, they're, they're, this is one of those cases where we're like, you know, the Russians under Soviet rule trying to figure out what the government's up to, you know, oh. Read the signs in the heavens, or the tea leaves, or you know the wall posters is in China. Well, I mean, I, I've heard that you know, I don't know if this is true that they somebody seized Pelosi's laptop during the so-called insurrection, and they mm-hmm. have the goods on her, and it, I don't know they, that could just be wishful thinking. But the point is that 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 you know, on the one hand, you're absolutely right the needs of empire and the military budget are extremely important and compelling as they were when they whacked JFK, you know, and Mm -hmm. the reason why they did, Mm -hmm. that's not changed. And they want to continue their wars. Uh, There's a neoconservative fanaticism here. You know, they want their Pax Americana. Mm -hmm. They want war with Russia. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the fact that we're living through a kind of globalist uh, campaign, that COVID is at the service of a globalist agenda, right. Okay. that the vaccine rollout is a global thing, masking is a global thing. Hmm. The World Health Organization is um, a global entity and a globalist entity. Uh, and the Great Reset is a globalist plan. So you go back and you look at like David Rockefeller, who, who says explicitly in his autobiography that he has always been accused of believing in one world government. And to that charge, he proudly pleads guilty. Mm-hmm. That's what they want. Mm-hmm. They like the Chinese model. You know, mm. they, they I mean, on the one hand, there's all kinds of chest thumping and, you know, games of chicken in the South China Sea. And, you know, Team Trump is very, you know, uh, sinophobic and, and there's all that, the usual thing. You think they're preparing war. But at the same time, there are signs of um, collusion at the very top. Uh, you know, we could, I mean, both the British press and the Chinese press in late January of, of last year came out with these harrowing videos and photos of people dropping dead in the streets from COVID. OK, right. in retrospect, that looks kind of like World War One style photographic propaganda because people don't drop dead in the streets from COVID. Right. But both those countries presses were doing that. And it was China that came up with the ventilator policy that's killed so many mm-hmm. uh, patients, especially old ones, nine out of ten. Mm-hmm. It was it was that policy that the World Health Organization held up as exemplary and told the whole world to follow it. <laughs> It was China's uh, really super tough crackdown that um, lockdown, I should say, that that the World Health Organization hailed as the best practice, and then hailed New Zealand for following it to the letter. Right, mm-hmm. while Nicaragua's approach, uh, like Sweden's, 
uh, and, and Belarus was much more um, sensible and in the long run, much more effective. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, they were either vilified as, as Sweden was and then pressured mm -hmm. or, or ignored. Nicaragua has never come up and they have had a, a tremendously successful uh, uh, deal, you know, uh, India too, by the way, has done very, very well because hydroxychloroquine is available over the counter in that country oh. because of its uh, pervasive malaria. Oh. And HCQ is a malaria remedy. Oh. Pakistan as well. That country should be um, just, you know, a heap of corpses by now <laughs> because of the close proximity and the poverty and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. They've suffered vastly more from the lockdowns than from COVID. And the press has been, you know, silent on this. There was the biggest protest in human history in India, maybe three weeks ago. I did, what? I didn't know this. <laughs> My point exactly. Yes, I have not heard of this. <laughs> 200, check it out. 250 million what? farmers and workers protested. The, the, the lockdown policy and the, the crushing of the economy. What? Yeah, I, I sent it to my list serve. Oh my um, gosh. You know, you should join uh, because oh I send God. out stuff like that. Okay. And you can sign up at my website. Uh, I'm assuming I'll still be able to use email uh, over the coming uh, months. <laughs> Don't, <laughs> Don't primary... take that for granted. <laughs> no, I can't. Because today I just sent something my lit to my list noting. Yeah. But since last night, I've received a surprisingly small number of emails, which is yeah. you know, a little alarming, but um, it, it, certainly in keeping with the tenor of the times, because as you say, we are at war uh, with domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. We therefore must not question the safety of these vaccines, mm -hmm. lest we contribute to vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm. We must not question the outcome of the election, lest we abet the retention of power by hair a trump you know right there are things we must not question and my view uh you know is and it's an old-fashioned liberal view is that um there should be uh, free speech for all uh no matter how heinous uh we may find somebody's statements or arguments you know I short short of outright incitement to violence uh there should be free speech. This is why the ACLU, Thank right? You. Yeah, they've, yeah, they've given up. They're no oh. longer the ACLU. They're not the, right. The ACLU is, uh, uh, there must be people in your uh, audience who don't know that they famously, in, infamously in some people's eyes, uh, sued on behalf of the Illinois Nazi party sure. so that they could demonstrate in the streets of Skokie, Illinois. Right. This is a suburb with a huge Jewish in, population. In the 1970s, right? Uh, maybe, 70s. yeah, in the 1970s. Yeah, right. It mm -hmm. was a free speech issue. Mm -hmm. They had no use for the Nazis, and they were certainly sensitive to the feelings of those residents, many of whom were survivors of the camps. Of course, it was a disgustingly provocative thing for the Nazis to do. Mm -hmm. They had the constitutional right to do it. Right. Um, the ACLU today has become a kind of a woke yeah. uh, outfit. You know, they, right. they are... Uh, basically down for the social justice um, agenda. You know, they are, they have, I mean, they're all, to, to their credit, they have recently expressed some reservations <laughs> about how the war on domestic terrorism might affect free speech. Yeah. But they, they have really dropped the ball long since. Um, and, and, you know, when, when you have a left that's committed to censorship yeah. and uses it as a weapon, uh, you've you've got the um, makings of of, of serious uh, civic decline and and national degradation. You know that's I, my view. in my lifetime. I and I've always been anti-liberal. <laughs> um, I mean, in turn, I mean, I've been anti-American liberalism. I should say to be be clear here, right? Never in my lifetime, and I'm 55, and I've been following politics basically since I was born because my parents were political activist when I was born. Have I seen liberals give up on the First Amendment so readily? Am I right? Is this, I have just, why Why is that? Why now? Because is this just Trump derangement syndrome? Is it something else? Seems like it might be broader than that. Well, it's partly that, and it's partly uh, identitarian politics. You know? Yeah, right. That's it's right. Partly the, the um, 
devolution of the left into an identitarian movement. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I believe that this was to some extent kind of engineered um, Mm -hmm. in various ways, really starting in the 60s. Mm-hmm. You know, when the Ford Foundation, for example, was funding black separatist movements, mm-hmm. and it was run by McGeorge Bundy, mm-hmm. who was, you know, a Mandarin from D.C. Right. and close to the Rockefellers and an, archi- and, uh, and an architect of the Vietnam War. Again, everything is foreign policy. Everything right. comes back to foreign policy. So his commitment to people of color somehow did not extend to his involvement in the Vietnam War. Well, no. Do you not know what Dean Acheson's argument was against people who were hesitant to go into Vietnam? He said they were racist because they were unwilling to uplift the poor people of Vietnam who were going to be crushed under communism. It was, yeah. was actually the argument. It was racist to be opposed to the Vietnam War, which was the argument, one of the arguments made on behalf of the Iraq War, right? It was racist to believe that the brown people in Iraq couldn't be saved, shouldn't be saved by us. Yeah, that's right. Just as it was sexist to, to and sexist uh, to turn against the war in Afghanistan when the poor women of Afghanistan were being right. so horribly oppressed by the Taliban, which that's they right. were. That's right. But to have George and Laura Bush suddenly morph into feminists, you know? Yeah. And I, mean, I, I knew liberals and progressives who who bought this under the influence of 9/11. Oh. You know that they were so hypnotized by that. Even. Uh, even sorry, even Code Pink, even Medea Benjamin, who is usually a hundred percent on on war and, and empire and foreign policy, even for a moment they were they were supporting the occupation in Afghanistan because they were worried about what the Taliban would do to the women of Afghanistan. Again, identity politics trumps, so to speak, even issues of war and peace, the biggest issues of all. I mean, it's, yeah. it's so no, it's it's true. It's it's um. It doesn't, you sorry, know, it doesn't, they don't, I'm sorry, don't, they facilitate war. Identity politics has facilitated war and imperialism and conquest and occupation and the deaths of how many hundreds of thousands of people in Vietnam, as I said, in the Middle East now, uh, forever. I mean, in fact, that goes back to 1898, right? The racists in 1898 said, Let's not have an empire in the Philippines and Cuba because we don't want those brown savages. We don't have anything to do with them. We don't want a connection between our glorious empire and theirs or them. And it was the anti-racist progressives who were pushing hardest for the war for empire because they said, no, the racists are wrong. The Filipinos can become just like us. They can be raised up to our level. Of course, it's utterly narcissistic and cultural imperialism to begin with, right? But since the beginning, anti-racism has actually served the war effort and the American empire. Well, I, that's, that's a very good argument. And in fact, one could say that it's really two racisms at war with each other. That's right. It's a different form of racism. Uh, yeah. Paternal, it's paternalistic racism. Precisely. Right. The same, the same thing uh, was manifest um, in, in what uh, James Bradley is, calls the China Mirage, a great book by that title. Hmm about American China policy, hmm. which was founded on this missionary, literal missionary uh, view of the right. Chinese as potentially just like good Christian Americans, yeah. we are obliged to uplift them and civilize them and make them like us. Right. And that's why we have to support Chiang Kai-shek, you know, a, mm-hmm. a brutal, torturing, dictatorial monster and must not talk to Mao you know, who was craving um, an exchange with America as Ho Chi Minh had done. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is based on a, on a profoundly racist, paternalistic view of what who the Chinese people were, you know, mm-hmm. based on the mm-hmm. good earth by Pearl Buck. That's right. And uh, who's, uh, I think, the daughter of missionaries and the same with Henry mm-hmm. Luce, yeah. owner of the Time Life uh, Empire, who was Luce, yes, Henry Luce, born, born born in China, you know, born in one of these enclaves uh, that, that where there were American missionaries. Yeah. So yeah, this has this has a very long history. I mean, I see. I have to say, speaking of color, I see red when I when I hear people invoke race in defense of the mandatory vaccination and the lockdowns. I was going to say it's also racist for you not to wear a mask. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where to begin with this? First of all, first of all, there are certain conditions that should exempt people from masking because it, it, it threatens their health, if not their lives. Okay. One of them is asthma. 
Mm. One of them is diabetes. Mm. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, has very strict regulations on what people cannot be expected to mask in workplaces. And it's people with those conditions, high blood pressure. Okay, those three conditions that I've named are especially prevalent in the black community. Okay. Sure. So um, why should they all be wearing masks? You know, why were, why were they all ordered to wear masks in Milwaukee in August in the heat? Hmm. Okay. Uh, how is that? How is that not racist? Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you look into the history of, of the Gates Foundation's uh, vaccine campaigns all over Africa, um, you discover that, you know, like in Kenya, this anti-tetanus vaccine that they were giving people, women and girls of childbearing age only, uh, suspiciously enough, in a country with very little tetanus, it turns out that the vaccine was laced with, um, was an anti-fertility vaccine, that had actually been, uh, the development began in the 70s. I mean, the, the, this whole history oh. is fascinating. And then Rockefellers are very involved in this. The Rockefellers who were down with eugenics all throughout the 20th century. For sure. Uh, founded the Population Council in 1952, you know, mm -hmm. because the Holocaust had given eugenics a bad name. Mm -hmm. uh, Hitler, having uh, studied avidly uh, the works of American eugenicists and the anti miscegenation laws in the South and the sterilization laws in the United States. Yep which were uh, uh, written and passed with eugenicist support. Yep. Uh, Hitler was, was really down with all of that, heavily influenced by it and put it into practice yep. uh, to, uh, on a gr horrific scale. And when the world saw that, uh, oops, mm, eugenics, uh, let's call it something else. So they call it population reduction. And the or control, population control. Population control. Yes, so the, right. the Rockefeller Gates connection is a very tight one. Yep. Gates has made no secret of his interest in population reduction. Mm -hmm. He's used different mm -hmm. arguments to advance it. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't see how you can possibly justify um, demanding that these policies be enforced and, and, and respected and protected from all criticism when they've had such a demonstrably destructive effect on, on people of color whom you profess to, you know, stand with, you know? Uh, so if you don't wear a mask, you're a racist, uh, right? <laughs> Maybe if you don't get the COVID shot, you're a racist. I mean, black people are understandably suspicious right. of the white medical establishment. That's I right. mean, anyone who hasn't read Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington had mm -hmm. better get a copy because that's mm -hmm. a devastating history of what black people have suffered at the hands of white doctors and medical institutions since the, the days of slavery. Yeah, Tuske it's, Tuskegee again is just a tip of the iceberg, right? Exactly. That's the one we've all heard of. Right. As, as, as Harriet Washington points out, but mm -hmm. that there was that that's just the least of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now Bill and Melinda Gates, who've been all over Africa trying to get the population lowered there, <laughs> uh, want black people to be first in line to get these poorly tested shots. I'm sorry, but um, right. I think vaccine hesitancy is justified uh, in that case. And I think it would be immoral to say otherwise. Why, back to, yeah, well, we are talking about COVID. Why is it that the political establishment in both parties wants us to wear masks? Well, I mean, my view, okay, and this is, this is separate from the way I teach the subject. I want to make this clear because mm -hmm. uh, I don't flog my view <clears throat> when I teach. I, I will mention what I've discovered and urge them to look into it. But since you ask, I think that masking, <clears throat> first of all, is, um, is a way to get people used to complying with dictates like that. Uh, you, you do this and it's represented to you as, as the only decent thing to do. If you don't do it, you're putting everybody at risk. Everybody has to do it. And there's a kind of scientifically groundless argument that if everybody doesn't do it, the masks don't work, right? Mm -hmm. 
So if you're wearing a mask and you see somebody without one, you're evidently convinced that yours isn't going to be effective because that other person has to wear one too. So it, it, it is a way of, of exerting, of encouraging mass compliance and of making people, frightened people, um, executors of that, of that mandate. Everybody has to wear them, as in New York. Everybody's wearing them in New York, you know, and in other places like New York. Despite their uh, deleterious effect on health and despite their... Um, unproven usefulness, uh, there's more and more evidence, uh, uh, medical evidence, studies, and clinical observations that note um, that masking really is bad for you, that it increases the risk of respiratory infection. It doesn't lower it mm -hmm. uh, because of the bacteria and the fungi that are trapped in the mask and the way you're breathing in your own pathogens, which the body wants to expel. And let me note that Dr. Vernon Coleman Okay. kind of a towering figure in British uh, medicine and, and a great writer, very prolific, has a new essay out about uh, masks, a long piece. It's kind of a definitive takedown oh. of the whole, the whole myth. So first of all, psychologically, it helps to um, use people to get them used to okay. uh, complying. Secondly, it, it also is a way, a way of extending lockdown by other means Mm. That society is um, in, 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 in bondage of a sort. You know, the slaves were often required to wear masks. I don't know if you've ever seen these horrible pictures of, of slave women with masks attached to their mouths. It was a form of punishment for, you know, uh, impertinence. Okay. Um, in Reading Jail, Oscar Wilde, you know, where he was incarcerated, oh. they had to wear masks as a punishment. Mm. I mean, it's, it's punitive. There's something sadistic about it. Um, so it's not pleasant and it interferes with human fraternity and society. So it's a way of making people feel that they're held hostage as, as a society against the day when, when the vaccines are given. And the compliance in masking, I believe, is intended to carry over into compliance with the vaccine mandate. Mm. Okay. I think mm -hmm. that's the purpose. Okay. Now, the fact that it is unhealthy and provably unhealthy uh, uh, for and unnecessary with children, I feel very strongly about this, you know, has to make one wonder why they would be pushing it like this, why they would be insisting that, you know, there are no medical exemptions when technically there are in most states. Um, in the fine print of these regulations, there are medical exemptions, but the, the cops and the maskers will not care about that. It's not even occurring to them as they spot um, a transgressor. You know, mm -hmm. They want that person to put on a mask. It doesn't matter if they have asthma or COPD you know, or some other such condition. Why do they do that? Why do they uh, uh, actively discourage the use of hydroxychloroquine when it has demonstrably saved lives? Why have they been silent on ivermectin, which is another extremely effective remedy? Mm -hmm. Why are they doing this? Why did the uh, British government recently drop its recommendation of vitamin D when vitamin D is, is proven to be useful in bolstering the immune system? and making you less susceptible to COVID infection or any respiratory infection. Why do that? Black people are, are more vitamin D deficient than others. This mm -hmm. is a medical fact. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the absorption of sunlight. You know, mm -hmm. Why would they do that? I mean, th that's not what a government concerned about public health should be doing. So I don't pretend to know. I can only say that, that these policies uh, do not suggest a concern with, you know, ensuring that people be healthy and well. They, they seem to be intended to do something else, um, which I think people should just think about as long as that's legally allowed. But these Democratic governors in California and New York and elsewhere, I mean, Cuomo just now sent out some tweet that he's, he's finally starting to see the light, I suppose, but they are destroying their own economies. Right. I mean, that's what it, that's where the political calculus to me gets a little confusing. Why would Gavin Newsom want to destroy the economy of the state that he's governing? That is not good for an incumbent's chances. 
Well, first of all, I, ha I hate to say it, but it doesn't really matter in as much as the will of the electorate is irrelevant to the outcome of elections. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And um, hmm. secondly, I think that the uh, political leadership of all those states in many countries is on board with the Great Reset. Okay. And that is that entails the destruction of the independent economy. Yeah. So what is, how do you read the, re, what's your interpretation of the Great Reset? What do these people want? I mean, you've talked about China. They apparently have some attraction to the Chinese model, yeah. but they are not, you know, again, we're talking about establishment Democrats and Republicans here, right? And their auxiliaries in the media, right? That's who we're talking about. Yeah. They are not communists. You know, you and I have been on the left way too long to know that they are not communists. That's what idiotic, that's what idiotic right wingers say about them, but they're not communists. These are, this is a different species politically, right? I think uh, so. How would you identify them politically? And what is it about the Chinese model that they want to emulate and not? Well, let, let me begin by noting that Andrew Carnegie actually called himself a socialist, sure, yeah. which is interesting. And what he liked about it and what drew um, some on Wall Street and in the city of London to help support the Russian Revolution uh, you know, there are several books on this. It's very controversial. But the idea of socialism appealed to the likes of Carnegie because what it meant to him was top-down control and no competition. Oh, okay. That's what they want. I mean, that's what the Rockefellers wanted. That's that's what yeah. made the Rockefellers was, uh, you know, monopoly. Right. Destroy the competition. Okay. Uh, and they hate competition. I mean, for all the commitment to capitalism, Right. They're not into competition. They want to end it. Mm -hmm. and the Great Reset is something that I think Marx could not foresee, you know, because Marx was just completely committed to this Hegelian notion uh, based on endless class struggle, you know, that, that the system would eventuate in a kind of dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. Well, with AI and high tech uh, and so on, um, that whole calculus has, has changed radically. And what the goal here is, I, I believe, and the Great Reset's part of it, is a way to realize it, is a kind of um, neo-feudalism, hmm. uh, basically maintained through the most sophisticated artificial intelligence systems imaginable, which will enable absolute surveillance and control down to the level of individual biology. Yeah. I mean, it's pure dystopia. It's, it's something for which we'd be better prepared by the works of the great dystopian novelists and the likes of Philip K. Dick, you know, Orwell's 1984 mm -hmm. than by reading Marx's capital, mm -hmm. because what we're talking about here is a kind of, of iron control that bespeaks um, the same really almost psychotic commitment to power yeah. that Orwell nails in 1984. That's what the inner party is all about. They are driven by that. Mm. It is power. As O'Brien famously says to Winston Smith at the end, <laughs> climax of the novel, harrowing, you know, re-education of Winston Smith at the the object of persecution is persecution. Mm -hmm. The object of torture is torture. The object of power is power, right? He says, we are different from all the oligarchies of the past and that we know what we are doing. The Nazis thought they were gonna usher in this sort of racial utopia, it was based on race. And the, the Bolsheviks believed that they were gonna take power in order to realize this dictatorship of the proletariat. So it was an economic, a class-based agenda. Right. The inner party, please, you know, let's not kid ourselves. That's not what we're about. We're about power. We're about control and maintaining it. They're not racists, right? They're not capitalists. They want control. When you get to that level of wealth and privilege, 
you know, enjoyed by the likes of the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the Windsors and Gates and Bezos, you know, people whose wealth is just breathtaking and whose, whose, whose power is, is really something awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're, you're talking about people who don't, who don't think in traditional ways, you yeah. know, about, about what they're trying to do and what it takes to get there. So I, I think we have to face that. And it's very difficult to do. But it's necessary to, to, to understand what's, what's coming down. Uh, you know, uh, otherwise, it doesn't make any sense, as you say. It makes no sense politically in traditional terms. Right. The governors were, would abet the demolition of their own economies. Yeah. They're doing it, though. They're doing it all over, and they're not stupid. They can't be that stupid. Uh, they, they, they know that the voters uh, in, in overwhelming numbers are, are opposed to it. Um, they don't care, you know, because elections have been gamed. So that's not a problem. And also, and also, their voters believe that Trump is responsible for COVID. Right, try, yeah, everything is Trump's fault, you know. Right. And, and um, I, don't, I, I don't, I don't see Trump making any of these points, you know. Um, I, I wouldn't expect him to, but the point is that I don't really believe he's opposed to this deep down either. There's nothing populist about Trump. Trump has been screwing workers and small business people for decades, you know, as as a buccaneering. New York City real estate developer who worked with the mafia, you know, <laughs> he didn't learn any kind of populism or concern for the working people of the country from Fred Trump, you know, right. um, and it's just a fantasy to think that he is, that he's imbibed that. And, and this comes from the fallacy of assuming that your enemy's enemy is your friend, you know, I mean, you hate the deep state or you hate the liberals. Okay, well, Trump must be a good guy, you know. But sometimes we have to face the fact that your enemy's enemy can kill you too. Right. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think we've got to get over the Republican versus Democrat thing. It's time to just give up on that. Right. Uh, we, left, right is irrelevant. It's a distraction. I think that, you know, from the videos and interviews and writings I've looked at from people who were in the streets of Washington last Wednesday, that was a huge, peaceful, basically idealistic protest. Okay, and what happened in the Capitol was a very specific thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was ca- you know camera ready. Mm-hmm. Cops were facilitating the entry into the Capitol of all these guys. The guy with the horns and the face paint. I mean, are you kidding me? That's what gets all the attention, and that has driven a lot of people nuts. You know, with rage, mm-hmm. and they're calling it an insurrection. You know, mm-hmm. and a coup. And a coup, you know, like Trump's going to take over. These guys are going to take over the government. Salvador Allende would have something to say about that. You're so right about that. I mean, (laughs) read a little bit about what coups entail in Chile, in Iran, in Guatemala, in Ukraine. Coups do not involve a ragtag band (laughs) of pissed off amateurs yelling in the Capitol building and banging on doors. With no militia, with no military, no militia, not even any guns, as far as I could tell. Right. Well, I mean, maybe some had were told some had guns. The only person who got shot was shot by a cop. Right. There's you no know? evidence, no evidence of guns. But anyway, there certainly was nothing, no chance. There was no there was no faction of the military that was supporting them. Right. That's what happens in other countries when we have an actual coup. Right. Well, yes. Right. That's exactly what a, a coup entails. I mean, um, yeah. But, but my God, what a wonderful pretext to destroy the First Amendment. Yeah, it's traumatized people uh, because of the way it's been sold. Uh, It's traumatized them as sort of as as 9-11 did. That was a real, I mean, a lot of people really died then. You saw what AOC said, maybe you didn't. I think she said this today uh, that uh, we need uh, the many members of Congress are now discussing taking measures against disinformation and misinformation because we can't allow that to happen. We, she said we cannot allow misinformation and disinformation to be spread in the media. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, she's been down with every plan like that all along. But you know, I mean, I, don't you remember not to, it seems to me that most of my life, even though I've always been a critic of the liberal establishment, at least that was taboo to threaten to threaten the first amendment directly that's a direct threat to the first amendment and i liberals am i right used to they used to be pretty good on that 
right? The, when the ACLU was actually the ACLU and actually defended civil liberties and, and freedom of speech, this is, this is a new crew. This is a new, they're younger. They're coming out of woke, the woke academies, right? And freedom of speech is very unpopular for people under 40 who are left wing. Well, uh, yes, that's certainly true. That, that, that attitude is encouraged in universities, but I, I would consider these people the shock troops of, of, an, of an effort that has been in the works for years. You know, sure. it was, um, in 2014, uh, David Cameron of the UK gave a speech, I think it was at the UN. You can find this online. I, I'm sure you can find this online, mm -hmm. in which he actually says that um, uh, conspiracy, nonviolent non conspiracy theory is more dangerous than terrorism. Mm. And he's linking that to Islamic fundamentalism. But, mm. but it's, his language is loose enough to suggest. And he actually says that, you know, that nine, he uses 9-11 as an example. Right. This characterizes it as the view that it was a Jewish plot, which, you know, some few people in the truth movement say, you know, I think some of them are assets, actually. But that's not what 9-11 truth is about. But that's a way to throw 9-11 truth into the mix of what's especially dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, and in that speech, he's actually saying we have to take every step possible to uh, prevent this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The following year, Francois Hollande, president of France, actually proposed legislation to criminalize conspiracy theory. And he linked that to, to Nazism, neo-Nazism. Mm -hmm. So that was to protect Jewish people, you know, who were at There's, existential risk, blah, blah, blah. And, that's our, and that is our blueprint, I'm afraid. I think that's the blueprint. Well, it is the blueprint. And understand that this actually started under, in this country, under Obama, mm -hmm. when um, Cass Sunstein, the constitutional scholar, wrote an, an, uh, co-wrote an essay uh, under the auspices of Harvard, um, proposing uh, what he called cognitive infiltration. I know. Right. Of uh, This is a way to uh, derail discussion of 9-11. Uh, he was going to, he wanted to infiltrate, like, I think it was, it wasn't like online forums or something like yes. that. Yeah, right. right. You, you have a, you have agents, you know, take part in online discussions of 9-11 and mm -hmm. sow discord and introduce, you know, uh, explosive notions. I mean, this is a kind of new wrinkle on uh, COINTELPRO practices, yeah. you know, yeah. basically mm -hmm. the way to disrupt and divide the left. This is a constitutional scholar who then went to work for the Obama administration. Right. So yeah, you're, we're talking about neoliberals who um, have completely uh, betrayed the, the noble tradition of American liberalism, mm -hmm. represented in my view by the likes of John Kennedy and, you know, Bobby mm -hmm. and others who were passionate believers in free speech. And if you take AOC's position, you are not really a, a leftist in any traditional sense. Yeah. You are kind of a leftist in the ch Chinese sense, I guess, <laughs> but you are uh, closer to fascism uh, than you are to any recognizably left tradition. I was gonna say, or perhaps Maoism. I mean, I, I pick up hints of Maoism in this, you know, uh, well, uh, other friends of mine have made that suggestion that there's a kind of Maoist flavor to all this. It, it is, you know, all these roads are leading to Rome, you know, Rome being the imperial <laughs> city. Good choice. Uh, yes. right. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, it's a high tech Rome, you know, it, yeah. it's a Rome where everybody's a slave, you know, it isn't just that some own them. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a world where the, the very, very rich have so much land so much property. Uh, you know, Ted Turner, who is really a rabid eugenicist. I mean, he oh. thinks the population should be cut oh. by like up to 95%. Oh, I didn't know that about Ted. Oh, oh absolutely. And he oh. has five children. Okay. <laughs> and he's, uh, you know, surely on board with Bill Gates's, um, you know, plan. And this is part of the great reset is to have us all eating lab grown meat and algae and bugs as sources of protein. And this is all packaged as uh, good for the planet kind of the animals. Mm. You know, stuff has always got a woke 
disguise on, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they're not going to stop eating meat, just as they're not going to vaccinate their kids, and they're not going to stop having children. Gates has three, okay? Right. Trying to get all these Africans to have none, you know, he and, and Melinda have three, you know, hello? If we're as concerned about the environment, how many, how many mansions does this guy have? Yep. Does he ever fly anywhere not on one of his private jets? I mean, mm -hmm. we could go on and on. David Rockefeller had five children. You know, they, they, they breed like rabbits. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, just like the Roosevelt's and the Bushes. There's just, they're always coming out of the woodwork and the Kennedys too. <laughs> well, right, but the Kennedys were not eugenicists. You know, in fact, they, they, they were not, they were opposed to that. Um, well, we, very... we'll have another, we'll have another interview in which we argue about the Kennedys, but yes, uh, I, I, your point is definitely on is, uh, I agree with there uh, that okay. the hypocrisy, certainly. Um, I, uh, I want to let you go, but I want to have one, I have one last question for you. Um, are, are you no longer teaching the, um, propaganda course at NYU? Well, not this semester. I, I agreed I wouldn't. Okay. Um, so that's that. And, uh, both my, I have to teach two sections of the same film course. It's going to be a little confusing for me, but um, you know, they're both more than full, uh, you know, as usual. Mm -hmm. And I'll try to do my best teaching it online, which is a complete drag, but um, mm. that's, you know, I have no alternative to that. I've been asked to offer um, a propaganda course online for the public. And uh, that's an intriguing idea. Um, which I'm thinking about. Uh, okay. and, um, I might do one in the summer if that's still legal. Uh, I will. I will be asking you to do that for Renegade University. I will be making an offer to you. Are you going to start Renegade University? We we already have started. We have many courses. We have webinars going on right now, and you get paid money, real money. To well, teach. that's awfully nice. And you hear. and you and you certainly would make serious money if you were to teach that course at Renegade University. And the offer is right here, right now in front of you. Well, I, here we are in public. I'd shake your hand if that were permitted um, right. or possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. I'll bear that in mind. I, you know, I have to clear that with NYU because of, yeah. uh, you know, whatever. Okay. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, I am, I am teaching. I'm, I'm, I'm a tenured professor. I have no idea what's going to happen with this uh, review of my conduct um, or my um, case you know, my libel suit. Mm -hmm. I do hope people will support me. Uh, you know, people watching you will go sign my petition and, and, and donate to the uh, GoFundMe page. So everything is on your website. What's the URL again? Uh, it's markcrispinmiller.com. Okay. Uh, I think there's a link to the GoFundMe page on the petition and there's a link to the petition on the first page of the uh, website. Right. And you can also join the listserv I have to say that my, my, my feeling is that all of this is about to be further curtailed, you know, hmm. and, and we may be moving back towards perish the thought, the days of uh, old, old media and uh, you know, paper, uh, Sam is dot passing documents from yeah. hand to hand. Yeah. I mean, I, I am a trog when it comes to tech matters. I mean, a real primitive. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not the person to discuss this with, but there must be some extremely clever uh, people in the tech world who can come up with ways to evade the surveillance. Oh, we've got and, it. Yeah. Uh, we, we can I, do it in many I, ways. Many I ways. Hope yeah. It's true. And, and continue to communicate with each other. Exactly. Because that's crucial, you know, yeah. uh, you know, let me just add that um, China has been um, really preeminent in in the realm of policing online uh, interaction, right? They have a huge police force dedicated to that. Everybody in China knows it. I have many Chinese students. It's a fact of life. Everybody faces it. Mm -hmm. In this country, um, there are still some people who think that we, we have this commitment to free speech and, and that can't happen and it shouldn't happen, but it's happening. We have uh, uh, an internet that's now dominated by private companies mm -hmm. like Google and, and Facebook and then there's Apple and uh, Twitter and so on. And they are all shutting down even as we speak. Every day brings word if we can still get emails 
of yet another voice that's been silenced. You know, Ron Paul, this is an absurd story, wrote a piece criticizing big tech for censorship and then Facebook banned him for it. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess you could say they did him the favor of proving his point. Exactly. But the, the, that, you know, when you have a completely privately run media system, <clears throat> you're, you're going to have a system that's more and more like China's and they are tending in the same direction. Right. Well, it's a privately run system that is in lockstep and gets subsidies and favorable regulations from the governments of state <clears throat> and federal. Right. Exactly. And, and the, the merger of state and corporate power is a definition of fascism. Yeah. It's the one Mussolini used. Cor- corpor- corporatism is the name of that, which is the core component of fascism. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And uh, that's that's what these woke. uh Sensors are are abetting, you know. Yeah. So it's just time to rethink what it means to be left and how progressive AOC and the squad really are. Mm-hmm. AOC, who who stood with the Bolivian coup, you know. Mm-hmm. AOC, who joined in piling on Venezuela. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just don't see a progressive there, uh, you know. And I and there are questions about the Green New Deal as well that really need to be asked. Yes. So um, yes, yes. I guess you and, you and I can agree on our shared commitment to asking those questions. Exactly. Uh, excessive skepticism. I think there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, sir, uh, you are not alone. You have many friends and allies in this fight and in many other fights. And I hope this is not the last time we talk. And I mean that I will be giving you a real proposal for you to teach propaganda or really any course you want for Renegade University. So, well, that's great to hear. Thank yeah. you so much. Are yeah. you gonna are you gonna run this entire conversation? Absolutely. That's what we do here. Wow, it's epic. Well, that's great, and thank you for keeping after me about doing this because um, it's been a real pleasure. Great. Well, it's been a great pleasure for me and a great honor. All right, Mark. Thank you so much. You take care and best of luck. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Talk soon. Okay. Great. Bye. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To join the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. To join the new Unregistered Underground, the supporting listeners group for the podcast, go to unregisteredunderground.com. Thanks for listening.